Good morning, church. Good morning. What a day. You guys, I don't know if you're feeling that, but I almost needed a few extra seconds to gather myself because the Holy Spirit is moving something fierce in here today. Amen? Amen. It's a big day. This is a day that the Lord's made. And we are continuing our series, Love Your Neighbor, Like a Good Neighbor, State Farm is there, fantastic, right? You guys have heard it time and time again. Or, uh, what is that song, Won't You Be My Neighbor, Mr. Rogers, right? We all have this expectation, and we see it across in other media forms and commercials and everything, to be a good neighbor. And I am a practical application guy. My dad used to talk to me, and I'd be like, Dad, cut to the chase. What do I need to do? Today, what you're going to do is you're going to invite the Holy Spirit in. And you're going to say, God, you are the Lord of my life. And I'm going to let you lead me today. And I want you to repeat that and do that every single morning. And your life is going to change. So, in the spirit of loving your neighbors, I will give you 15 seconds to stand up and greet someone that you did not come to church with. Come on, people, on your feet. We got 15 seconds. We only have a limited amount of time. Okay, okay, back to your seats, back to your seats, that's enough. Love your neighbors, but not that much. All right, hey, we've been going through this series. Last week we spoke about the barrier of time and how love is spelled T-I-M-E. I've never loved anyone in my life that I haven't spent time with. Amen? Today we're talking about the barrier of fear. And if you want to know somebody who's fearless, Pastor Paul. And Paul, don't ding me for this, but I heard him singing. And that man is fearless. <laughs> but seriously, though, we have fear. And I think that fear is the anticipation of change. It's commencement Sunday. We are sending out the seniors into the world. You've done your job. You've graduated. Congratulations, seniors. We can clap for that. But seniors, I know, because I stood in those shoes, that you're looking at this and you're saying, oh my gosh, I'm going to have a roommate. I'm going to have to live with somebody I don't know. And parents, you're saying, my baby, my baby, I'm sending them off to college and I don't know who they're going to meet. I can't protect them anymore. I think that fear is the anticipation of change because you know Whatever it is in your life that you are experiencing, you know your life's going to look different after that change happens, whether it's positive or negative. If you want to experience fear, those of you who are married, you understand what that feels like. <laughs> because it's not the fear of being together, but it's the fear of being apart. That's a change that nobody wants to experience. But... When I was younger, I used to be fearless, and I can't say the same thing for today. When I was younger, I used to get excited about pressing out of my comfort zone into boundaries and territories, which I didn't know and I didn't understand, but I knew that I would grow from that experience. So in about the early 2000s, there was a TV show that I used to love watching, whether my parents knew it or not. It was called Fear Factor. And... Don't worry, I have cut out of the script today my illustration. I was going to invite somebody up on stage, and we were going to reenact Fear Factor. Uh, you're welcome. But in fifth grade, there was a birthday party that I was invited to. It was a Fear Factor-themed birthday party. Fantastic. Awesome. I was excited because we were going to compete to see who was the most courageous, the most bold, the most fearless. 
Now, it wasn't exactly jumping back and forth between the tops of semis on a highway. It wasn't sticking our hand into a jar full of tarantulas to get a key. It wasn't eating some portion of pickled pig, but it was riding a mini bike around the driveway as fast as you can for a time trial. It was measuring how high you could jump on a trampoline, even holding our breath underwater. And if you know any stories about Marshall and water, you know they don't end well for me. You can ask my mother. But as weird of an example as that is, fear holds us back. And I used to be excited to have things that I was fearful of because I knew I could push through them. But what happened? Because now I have fear. And there are things in my life that do scare me. And there are things in my life that instead of approaching that thing that makes me fearful, I step back to what's comfortable because I don't want that change to happen. And I'll be honest, a few weeks ago, Pastor Paul, I was busting on you earlier, um, he approached me. He's like, Marshall, it's commencement Sunday. How do you feel about speaking? Mm. Um, sure, I'll do it because... I, uh, well, first of all, we love the students. We love the transition, the life, the growth that's happened in their lives, and we want to celebrate that. So at least I'm thinking somewhat rationally and saying, I would love the opportunity to speak to the seniors one more time. But my gut, it's this wrenching fear of saying, what if I'm not good enough? What if I don't do a good job? What if this is the last time Paul ever has me speak? Which, to be honest, is still up in the air. But for many of us, we don't want to say yes to that because we're fearful of how that may change. And for me, I wasn't sure what that was going to look like. But my gut was saying, this isn't comfortable. This isn't what I want to do. Do you know that in Scripture, we are actually commanded not to fear? It's in Isaiah 41.10. And I'll read it to you. You can read it up on the screen. Don't be afraid, for I am with you. Don't be discouraged, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, and I will help you. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. And essentially, we're being told, have no fear. Not that we are going to be protected from things that are making us fearful, but to not have fear in the face of those things. Because God is with us. Do you believe that God is with us here today? Yes. Do you believe that God is real and he's present? Yes. Then I believe that God is with us even in those moments in our lives right now which we are afraid. And he says, don't be discouraged for I'm your God. This isn't a false God we're talking about. We're talking about someone who's real. Do not be afraid. I'm your God. I'm here. And he shows up time and time again. So here I am, feeling terrified of these transitions, sitting in the middle of my life. And seniors, you're looking at whatever lies ahead, and maybe you're fearful of that. But you see, don't do what I've done. Don't step back from the things that make you fearful. Don't resume that resting position of being comfortable because God is challenging us. And you know what that challenge is? Do you trust me? The truth is that God's mission is, un is incredibly uncomfortable to our personal lives. Get used to it. God's mission is incredibly uncomfortable to my life. God's mission is uncomfortable to your life. He has not called you to a life of comfort. He has called you to a life of sacrificial love, just as we have seen him do for us through his son, Jesus. You see, God wants us to be challenged because when we continuously live in comfort, we continuously choose ourselves and he's not really the Lord of our life then, is he? We weren't made to rest on our blessed assurance. 
We were made to move. We were made to go. We were made to love our neighbors. And every time that I've done something that is within my strength, within my comfort zone, I'll go as far as say that's glorifying myself. Because when I depend on him, he gets the glory. When I depend on me, I'll pat myself on the back. I can't reach it, but I sure would like to sometimes. We're not called to be comfortable. We are called to be faithful. I'm going to say that again. We are not called to be comfortable. We are called to be faithful. And John 16, 33 says this. I have told you all of this so that you may have peace in me because here on earth you will have many trials and many sorrows. But take heart because I have overcome the world. And I don't know about you guys, but that last song, Peace Be Still, was just singing to me because he is here and it is well. And God is with you in those trials and the sorrows. And I'm not saying that you can't experience those, but I'm saying he's with you, and it's going to be okay. How many of you guys have a dog? Raise your hand. I want to see some hands. Fantastic. You guys love those little guys? Right? You have a fence to keep your dog within the boundaries of your backyard, presumably? Okay. All right. Cool. We're going to talk about fences a little bit. So it's this thing where I'll be honest, this fence is put there as a barrier because you want to keep those guys safe. You want to know that they're safely within their boundary. They are safely out of the neighbor's yard and away from the cat. And to us, fences can somewhat be a control over the environment. Backyards have nice things now like hot tubs and patios and cornhole and I don't know, tree forts, I guess. But it's the privacy we love that nobody else can bother us, that it's our little oasis, that it's our resting place, that it's, although it's our sanctuary, sometimes it's our way of keeping other people out. You know where your, neighbor, where your neighbors live, and they know where you live, and you've made it very clear by putting a fence there. And I'm not saying... Physical fences are bad, but we're just going to talk through how spiritually that becomes a very bad thing because the more that we exercise control over our environment, the more it is that we sit back into comfort. And if any of you have ever seen the show Home Improvement, I'm going to reference a character in there who for the full eight seasons the only portion of this character that they revealed was the upper portion of his face. And that's Wilson W. Wilson Jr. from Home Improvement. And he's an awesome character, mysterious man, and somewhat of a sage as he just gives good life advice to Tim Allen. But I can't help but think about what happens when our life and our relationship with God looks like that relationship where we keep God behind that fence and we only ever see glimpses of him because we have that control over our little boundary. So these symbolic fences, actually, they stop us from loving God with our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength. And sometimes, to be honest, it's more comfortable to keep him there. Because we're afraid of what it looks like to invite him in. Did you know that Jesus was often accused by the religious leaders of being a sinner? We're talking about the pure and spotless lamb. The Pharisees would constantly nag on him saying, You sinner, you surround yourself with people who are culturally dirty. And I'll just list a few. Prostitutes, lepers, tax collectors, demon-possessed, 
the diseased, political extremists, the unlovely, people who wore masks during COVID, people who didn't wear masks during COVID. Jesus surrounded himself with the people that society said, these people are weird. These people are sinful. Stay away from them. Jesus was a friend of sinners. He was not a sinner. Jesus spent time with the people that maybe were walking down the road, and we see them, and we switch sides. Maybe he spent time with the person that you hear them walking down the hallway, and you close your door. Jesus spent time with the people who needed a Savior. So that's enough of my talking. Let's look to what Scripture says about this. And we're going to stay with a specific story of a very vulnerable, and I'll be honest, it's a little bit awkward. It's uncomfortable. It's an uncomfortable story of when Jesus was invited in the book of Luke to a dinner party by Simon a Pharisee. Now, Simon was probably looking for another angle, another way to throw dirt onto the name of Jesus, and another way to persecute him, another way to bring him down a notch because he was not liked by the Pharisees. So let's read in Luke 7, 36. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him. So Jesus went to his home and he sat down to eat. When a certain immoral woman from that city heard he was eating there, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume And then she knelt behind him at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet, and she wiped them off with her hair. She kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. And in this cultural setting, the tables were often low. And at a dinner party, they would recline onto their left elbows with their feet extended away from the table. So that probably explains how this woman had access to his feet. The second thing, culturally, they lived in a very different concept of communal living. Many homes, many places were not guarded by fences. Many houses did not have doors but mere drapings of cloth. And that might explain how this prostitute, someone so different than a Pharisee, were to find her way into this dinner party. Okay? And so this dinner party obviously is shocked because not only is a stranger gathered here, but she's doing something completely and culturally inappropriate. A prostitute walks into a dinner party, and this isn't a joke. It sounds like it. (laughs) And she has this beautiful perfume. It probably costs a year's worth of her wages, or if you're a youth pastor, too. (laughs) So she's sitting there, and she has this perfume, and she pours it onto the feet of Jesus, and she's weeping, and it's this pure, and it's this raw, and it's this unrestrained love of a sinner who's been saved by grace, and the dinner party's watching like, what the heck is going on? What, what is this rodeo, right? It's so uncommon. It's so uncomfortable. Jesus could have been fearful in that moment. This woman could have been fearful in that moment but they weren't because all she saw was her Savior. All she saw was her chance at freedom. And Jesus does something completely miraculous, if you're looking at it from my perspective, because he he accepts the love that she's giving, and he doesn't try to change it. I have a funny way of deflecting, and we're working on it, right? Right? We're working on it. When someone gives me a compliment, I cannot just say thank you. I have to say, oh, no, 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 like it's not a big deal. Like no worries. If this reason happened and that, it's like please don't compliment me. I'm fine. But Jesus accepts her love. So, yes, this woman pursued a lifestyle of sexual immorality, but it didn't matter. One thing to note as well, Jesus' feet were not clean. They aren't cute little baby feet. These are worn and dirty. And this woman is wiping them and weeping and washing them with her hair. Can you imagine the fear that she had to engage Jesus in this way in front of people who she knew 
would mock her, would shame her, would make her life miserable? Let's continue. The Pharisee who saw this, who had invited him, saw this, and he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She is a sinner. And then Jesus answers with a brief anecdote, as he likes to. A man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one and 50 to the other. But neither of them could repay him, so he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debts. Who do you suppose loved him more after that? And then Jesus goes on to explain, when Jesus entered Simon's home, he was not greeted with a kiss. But since she had been there, this prostitute, this unworthy woman, had been kissing his feet nonstop. He was not given water to wash his feet, yet this woman uses her tears and perfume to wash the dirt away. Simon did not anoint Jesus with oil when he walked in, yet she anointed his feet with oil. And so Jesus continues, I tell you, her sins, and I love how Scripture says this, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love, but a person who is forgiven little only shows little love. Then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. Let's talk about some takeaways because this scripture is really saying something incredible here. Here for our note takers is point number one. Star it, highlight it, underline it. God doesn't allow our condition to dictate his love for us. Amen? God does not allow our condition to dictate his love for us. It doesn't matter if we're dirty. It doesn't matter if we're unclean. It doesn't matter what we have done. God sees us as being created. God sees us as his child. It doesn't matter what your past looks like. You are loved. You are worthy to receive that love. So let's bring it, to ho let's bring it home to the parents. How many of you guys have kissed the cheek of your child that's sweaty and they smell like an outside dog? That's right. Amen. It doesn't matter what they've been doing. You made that. You love that. And you, you love those dirty kisses because you are their parent and you love them and nothing can change that. How many of you have kissed a boo-boo when you didn't want to kiss it? That's right. Does it actually make it feel better? No. But to you, you still love them. And to them, there's something about that love that changes their life. And that kind of love is accessible to us because when we understand that we've been loved by our Father, our Heavenly Father, in such a way, it changes the way that we think about things. It changes our boundaries because it says you don't have to be good enough because He is good enough. And He's in us. And Jesus isn't afraid that our dirt's going to rub off on Him. Here's the second thing, note takers, is that the love of God extends beyond our boundaries and our comfort zones. There's a cool quote from a book that I read a long time ago. The Perks of Being a Wallflower. And here it is. And this isn't scripture, but it's a great quote. And I love it, so I'm going to share because I'm speaking. All right? It says, we accept the love we think we deserve. Think about that. We accept the love we think we deserve. How many of us put up those boundaries? We put up those fences because, for whatever reason, we don't think that we deserve that level of affection, that level of love from people that God is putting in your life to love you in that way. And when you're denying the love that God has put in someone else, you're actually denying God. Ooh, that's heavy. And it should be. What if God has put people in your life to love you and to take care of you, but because you want to be loved in the way that you're comfortable being loved, you haven't been accepting it? 
Everybody here has neighbors. Everybody here has people in their life who maybe you felt God leading you to invite them over. Maybe you felt God leading you to show up for them. Maybe you're carrying groceries inside, and you're like, can't you see my arms are heavy? But this neighbor, they just want to keep talking, and you're just going to sit there and listen because you're going to have to choose to love them in the way that God has loved you. And I believe that as Christians, we are called to do that. I believe that as Christians, when we accepted Christ into our heart, that it dramatically is going to change the, the trajectory of our lives. I believe that if you are letting Jesus be the Lord of your life, it's going to change what your life looks like. And I believe that we are sending out our seniors today to go and be a beacon of light and truth in a world that we all know needs it. Here's what else I believe. It is not only their job. It's your job. How many of us have people in our lives, they have, we have offices, we have relationships, we have gym memberships we don't use, where God is calling you to go and you are called to be on a mission because we believe that God is here. We believe that God is present and that his calling on our lives is current. But you've done enough and you're sending your children and you've already paid for their college or maybe you've been attending this church for 15 years. My question is, are you done yet? I hope not because this isn't our home. This is not our home. And a lot of us are saving up for our kingdom here on earth. This is not our home. And if you've accepted Christ into your life, you know that you're going to be up there in heaven. So we got work to do, people. We got work to do. We've been going through this series. We've been talking about the concept of bless, to begin with prayer, to listen to them, to eat with them. Today we are adding a letter to that. It is serve them. I am charging all of you. We are sending our seniors from here today. We are sending you today to serve your neighbors, to love them as Christ loved us first. And this sinful woman, she held nothing back at the feet of Jesus. That's me. I want to be like that. I don't want to be at that dinner party watching. Amen? Amen. You are called today. Respond today. The Holy Spirit is here. He is with you today. He is with you tomorrow. Let that be true. Let that be true. We love you guys. We are here for you guys. But when you show up on a Sunday morning, you're not here for entertainment. I hope that you're here so that you're sent out. This is a touch point. And everyone who's here, we are on a mission together. And to God be the glory. To God be the glory that there are so many faces here of people that we love. So let's bring it home. And I'm going to end with prayer. So everybody bow your heads. God, we just want to thank you today. We want to celebrate your victory that has already come. God, we want to ask for you to fill up our hearts away from the spirit of fear, God, but to faithfulness. You have called us for such a time as this. I pray that your Holy Spirit emboldens us to step out and to reach out to our neighbors and to serve them in a way that is transcendent of the love and the relationships that they have with others around them. God, I believe in miracles, and I believe that you are working in our lives today. I believe, and I know, and I felt it, that you're working on my heart too. We trust you. We love you. And in your holy and in your powerful name, all God's people said, Amen.